Good morning, Emmanuel. Our service will begin shortly.
Over to you, Linda. Well, good morning. It's wonderful to be with you today. It's been uh, it's been a long time since I've been with this group of people, and I'm delighted to be here. And uh, I welcome you to this service. And if there is anyone who is with us for the first time or new to Emmanuel or Waterloo Wayside communities, we offer a very special welcome. We're really glad that you're here. We are an affirming congregation. We're not a religious people so much as we are a human people. We're a community of faith that includes people of no faith, people who doubt faith, and people who've been hurt by faith. We aspire to create a space that is safe and respectful, but also brave, as we challenge one another to be the best that we can be. We affirm all people for the natural gifts that we all bring individually and collectively as part of our age, race, culture, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, background, and wide range of, of abilities. We actively work toward anti-racism by dismantling the systems and the stories that privilege one race over another. So thank you for being with us and thank you to all of you because together we make this community an amazing place to be. So as we move into our time of worship, I invite us to light our Christ candles. There was once someone who said such wonderful things and did such amazing things, teaching and healing and helping and loving and inviting everyone to join in. That people were wondering who he was. And finally, they just couldn't help it. They had to ask him who he was. And when they asked him who he was, he said, I am the light of the world. And so we light this candle to remember and remind ourselves that the light of the world and the love, healing, and welcome is with us here in this time. And if you have a candle handy, you can light it uh, to join with us as a sign of unity. I invite us to share in our opening prayer. Let us pray. Mighty and tender God, we come to this time aware that though we would like to have open minds, sometimes we are like the people of Nazareth, Jesus' hometown, who can't see past the familiar to see the godly. We pray as we gather for this time of worship that you would help us to be open to the message you have for us, that we would look to those in our midst with eyes of love, eyes of embrace, eyes of humility. We pray that you would feed our souls with what we need for today and for the week to come. We feel sometimes that we are not the right ones to be your hands and feet in the world. So we pray that your grace would, in your grace, you would equip us and let us know that we have been equipped, that we might feel empowered to answer the call that you have for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus said to his disciples on his last night with them, when he wanted to impress upon them what was most important about his ministry. Love one another as I have loved you, so you are to love one another. The peace of Christ be with you all. And know that we are holding each other close in this time of being apart. Our opening hymn is from Voices United, number 222, Come Let Us Sing. Mm -hmm. Come, let us sing to the Lord our song. We have stood silently too long. Surely the Lord deserves our praise. Joyfully thank God for our days. O thirsty soul, come and drink at the well. God's living waters will never fail. Surely the Lord will help you to stand, strengthened and comforted by God's hand. You dwell among us and cause us to pray and walk with each other following your way. 
our precious brothers and sisters will grow in the fulfilling love they know. Desert shall bloom and mountains shall sing to the desire of all living things. Come all you creatures high and low, let your praises endlessly flow. Thank you, Rob and Nancy. So children's time today. I, um, I came across a book that I thought I'd like to share with you. And uh, this book, um, talks about, about what it's like to bring our stuff with us. And I see that we have Erica with us this morning, I think. So if you wanted to uh, open your mic and turn on your camera, you could do that. I'm not sure if we have any other children with us, but you're welcome to, uh, to do that as well, if you like. And yeah, I mean, for that matter, it doesn't have to be children. Anyone who feels uh, who they'd like to open their mic and turn on their camera can do that. All right, so this is called The Biggest House in the World and it's written by Leo Leone. Some snails lived on a juicy cabbage. They moved gently around, carrying their houses from leaf to leaf in search of a tender spot to nibble on. One day, a little snail said to his father, when I grow up, I want to have the biggest house in the world. That is silly, said his father, who happened to be the wisest snail on the cabbage. Some things are better small. And he told this story. Once upon a time, a little snail just like you said to his father, when I grow up, I want to have the biggest house in the world. Some things are better small, said his father. Keep your house light and easy to carry. But the little snail would not listen and hidden in the shade of a large cabbage leaf. He twisted and twitched this way and that until he discovered how to make his house grow. It grew and grew and the snails on the cabbage said, surely you have the biggest house in the world. The little snail kept on twisting and twitching until his house was as big as a melon. And by squeezing and pushing and by wishing very hard, he was able to add bright colors and beautiful designs. Now he knew that he was the biggest and the most beautiful house in the whole world. He was proud and happy. A swarm of butterflies flew overhead. Look, one of them said, a cathedral. No, said another, it's a circus. They never guessed that what they were looking at was the house of a snail. And the family of frogs on their way to a distant pond stopped in awe. Never, they later told some cousins, never have you seen such an amazing sight, an ordinary little snail with a house like a birthday cake. One day, after they had eaten all the leaves and only a few knobbly stems were left, the snails moved to another cabbage. But the little snail, alas, couldn't move. His house was much too heavy. He was left behind and with nothing to eat, he slowly faded away. Nothing remained but the house and that too, little by little crumbled until nothing remained at all. That was the end of the story. The little snail was almost in tears, but then he remembered his own house. I shall keep it small, he thought, and when I grow up, I shall go wherever I please. And so one day, light and joyous, he went on to see the world. Some leaves fluttered lightly in the breeze, and others hung heavily to the ground. Where the dark earth had split, crystals glittered in the early sun. There were polka dot mushrooms and towery stems from which little flowers seemed to wave. There was a pine cone lying in the lacy shade of ferns and pebbles in a nest of sand, smooth and round, like the eggs of a turtle dove. Lichen clung to the rocks and bark to the trees. The tender buds were sweet and cool with the morning dew. The little snail was very happy. 
The seasons came and went. But the little snail never forgot the story his father has told him. And when someone asked, how come you have such a small house? He would tell the story of the biggest house in the world. I wanted to share that because sometimes it seems that we, uh, we get focused on stuff. Good morning, Erica. How are you? Good to be with you. We're having a late breakfast snack. Oh, there you go. Those are the best. It's, uh, it's kind of like 11s is only it's 10s is. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's good to have you here, Erica. And uh, Charlotte. Charlotte is there as well. Charlotte Paradis. Yeah, hi. Hi. So, she's right here. Yeah, oh, okay. Right here. <laughs> well, it's good to have you I, with us. Right here, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I just wanted to share that story because sometimes we, uh, we get all caught up in having the biggest and the best and the most. And um, I, I just moved from Newfoundland and I can tell you sometimes having the biggest and the best and the most is not... <laughs> It's not very helpful. Sometimes it's a, it's a lot of stuff to have to deal with and it gets overwhelming. So I just wanted to share that little story with you and, um, and hope that you have a really good day and enjoy, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. All right. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. Do you want to say bye-bye, Erica? No. No, Erica doesn't want to say goodbye. All right. Well, I'll say goodbye to Erica. All right. Take care. <laughs> Take care. So our scripture this morning is from the gospel according to Mark in chapter six. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. On that Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is the wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the 12 and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, Stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. Our next hymn is from Voices United, number 572, Send Me, Lord. Send me Jesus, send me Jesus, send me Jesus, send me Lord, lead me Lord, lead me Jesus, lead me Jesus, lead me Jesus, lead me Lord, I will go. I will go, Lord, I will go, Lord, in your name, Lord, I will go. Thank you, Rob and Nancy. Let us pray. O oh God of grace and mercy, you call us to proclaim your healing and faithfully fulfill your kingdom mission. Let us not count the cost of our wins and losses, but keep our eyes fixed on you as we seek your realm of peace. 
May the words I speak and the reflection we all share find a response that is worthy of you, most just, most loving, and most compassionate God. Amen. For some time now, my daughter has been asking me if I would ever get a tattoo. I don't know if I ever would. Every time I think of it, I, I think of my younger cousin who said that he wanted to get a tattoo that read, it seemed like a good idea at the time. It's, it's not that I'm squeamish about getting a tattoo. I, I'm pretty sure I could handle the pain. The bigger concern is that I wondered if there was anything I would want to have on my body permanently, some kind of self-expression that I could stand by for the rest of my life. Well, I'm not sure, but if there was something I would consider getting, it might be a butterfly tattoo. Oh, that's sweet. You might be thinking a pretty butterfly, and in a way it would be. But the deeper message that others have shared with me, I wish I could say it's an original idea, but it's not, is that what a butterfly can see of itself is its legs and maybe its antenna and the underside of its abdomen. Serviceable, certainly, necessary, to be sure. They're hardly the most beautiful part of a butterfly, not what makes it uniquely and distinctly a butterfly. It's not the image of a butterfly as anyone else who looked at it would describe. It is a matter of perspective. And so it is in our scripture reading today. After an adventurous time of calming the storm in the Sea of Galilee, hearing a garrison man of an unclean, healing a garrison man of an unclean spirit, healing a woman who had been hemorrhaging for 12 years, and restoring a synagogue leader's daughter to life. Jesus and his disciples return to his hometown of Nazareth. While there, he attends at the synagogue on the Sabbath and begins teaching. He teaches in much the same way he was teaching on the shore of the lake before, when he shared a number of parables with the crowd that gathered. But whereas the crowd by the lakeshore was very keen to hear what Jesus has to say, even following him around, the reception that he gets in his hometown, decidedly lukewarm. First, they are astounded by Jesus' teaching. Now, astounded is an interesting word. It could mean impressed, but its meaning is colored by its context. And the context here is people who are anything but impressed. Skeptical, suspicious, yes. Impressed, no. Because you see, they know this man, Jesus. They knew him as a child. They knew him as a carpenter. And now it seems he has gotten too big for his britches. And thinks he has something to tell, to teach to the good people of the synagogue. And by the time they have thought this far, they are offended, even scandalized. He's just a charlatan, they seem to be saying. And well, this does sort of prove to be the case. Jesus tries to do deeds of power, miracles, but other than laying hands on a few people and healing them, he can do nothing. So he heads to other villages to teach. Then he gathers the 12 disciples together and sends them off two by two to cast out demons. It might seem like a pretty edgy thing to do, just after being well humiliated in his hometown. But Jesus is undeterred, no time to sulk and lick our wounds. Let's get on with the good news, the healing that we have to bring. The disciples might have been feeling a little apprehensive. After all, they've never attempted this casting out of demons. And now Jesus wants them to go off by themselves in pairs without him after the debacle of Nazareth and heal on their own. And as if that isn't enough of a challenge, he tells them not to take anything with them. No bread, no bag, no money, not even an extra tunic. Who does he think we are, they might be wondering, that we should be able to survive much less cast out demons when we are to go so unprepared on such a trip. We might look at ourselves, at our family, 
at our coworkers, at any group of which we are a part and say, I am just one little person or we are just ordinary folk. What could we possibly do in the face of all that challenges us today? Our church whose service to the community of faith and the community beyond has been so altered by the pandemic, the terrible discoveries of burials at the site of residential schools, death dealing violence perpetrated against our brothers and sisters of the book, a battered economy, even the oppressive heat we have been experiencing. Who are we in the face of these daunting circumstances? Jesus has the answer. He tells us that we are more than we give ourselves credit for. We are capable, resourceful, creative, strong. We need to have faith in ourselves. We need to have faith in the Christ that calls us, working together one with another, each of us with God through Christ, we can do what we thought we could never do alone. And those apprehensive disciples, they went as Jesus directed them to, with only his instruction, one of their companions and the clothes on their back. They were still able to proclaim that people should change their lives and their hearts. They were able to cast out demons and they anointed with oil many people who were sick and cured them. How? did they have such power? Their power, I believe, came from their faith in Christ and in the God who had sent him. Well, their vision was at times obscured. They could see enough of who Christ was to trust in his vision and the venture that he had planned for them. We are called by Christ to take the good news of God's kingdom to the world around us and to lean into Christ to do it, to share the compassion and love, justice and hope that the way of Jesus shows us. We don't need a lot of supplies or stuff or security to do it as if we don't have within us what we need. If we undersell ourselves or Jesus, we will be able to do so little. And while we can all metaphorically see ourselves in our plainness, ordinary arms and legs and torso. We need to have the faith that Christ sees who we really are, the beings with essential, powerful, artful, beautiful wings that God has fashioned for us, lifting us to do and to be that to which we are called. Amen. Our next hymn is from More Voices, number 176, Three Things I Promise. things I promise, holy God, in age and youth, in life and death, to bless your name and cling to Christ, and listen for the Spirit's breath. Your love unfolded time and space, and life and all that life became. And so with thankful heart and voice, through good and ill I bless your name. I follow, serve, and cling to Christ, Amid our cultures, tides, and trends, for here your name is most revealed, majestic love and best of friends. 
enlivened as the spirit moves to cleanse our awaken and renew i pray that justice peace and truth may seed and grow in all i do if i should live when vigor fades and family and friends are gone three acts of loving faith remain when days are slow and work is done revive and guide me living god as day by day until my death i bless your name and cling to christ and listen for the spirit's breath we come to the prayers of the people the pastoral prayer and once again i invite us to practice the art of praying with our eyes wide open seeing the world and those within it that we are called to tend In our pain, our blue, our beautiful, our hard, our messy, our ugly, our struggles and our joys, God is with us. God accompanying us, God alongside us, God amid us, God among us, God beside us, God by us, God including us, God near us, God plus us, God upon us, God as companion to us, side by side us, God in the thick of us, in the thick of our humanity, in the middle of this weary world, God is with us, in the gift and in the muck and mire of real life, we are called to be present, to be in the flesh with one another accompanying others, alongside others, amid others, beside others, by others, for others, including others, near others, a companion to others, side by side with others, in the thick the world in the thick of the beautiful and the messy. In that, a weary world rejoices. Gracious and loving God, we come to you with hearts that we seek to have open to your word and your love. There is so much around us that tears at us and wears us down. Keep us ever mindful of your presence and the hope you have given us through Christ. We pray that you would receive the prayers we offer on behalf of our community and our world. Our world is anxious for so many reasons, some beyond us but some within our grasp. We pray that you would break down barriers of hatred, suspicion, hierarchy, ideology that exist among peoples and nations 
and ask that you would restore and strengthen our common life. Give to your church a bold vision and a daring love to speak and act on behalf of your mission to restore all people and creation in peace. Teach us to trust simplicity and travel lightly together. Hear our prayers for all who need your tender touch of healing in their lives. Comfort all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Be with those who mourn. Expand our compassion, increase our faith, and make us whole as we work together for the healing of those in need. Let us pause and hold a moment of silence as we pray the prayers that lay upon our own hearts in this moment. And join me as we say together the alternative version of the Lord's Prayer. Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, Pain Bearer, Life Giver, Source of all that is and that shall be, Father and Mother of us all, loving God in whom we experience heaven. The hallowing of your name echoes through the universe. May the ways of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world. May your will be done by all created beings. May your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and be realized on earth. With the bread we need for this day, feed us. May we be forgiven in equal measure to which we forgive. And for the hurts we absorb from one another, heal us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. Giving is an act of worship, an act of relationship an act of love. And so as we worship this generous and giving God who seeks us in relationship, who loves us into being, we offer our gifts. And as we do, let us listen to our offertory and all the ways that you can support Emmanuel and Waterloo Wayside communities will come up on the screen. As I am, summon out what I shall be, set your seal upon my heart and live in me. Take, oh, take me as I am. Summon out what I shall be, set your seal upon my heart and live in me. Take, oh, take me as I am, summon out what I shall be. Set your seal upon my heart and live in me. Take, oh, take me as I am. Summon out what I 
shall be. Set your seal upon my heart and live in me. As we think of all those gifts that we have shared, let us offer our prayer of thanksgiving. O oh, Holy One, we thank you for your great generosity, for the gifts of life and love, for the majesty of maple trees waving in a summer sky, for the beauty of a butterfly from the sturdy body to the gossamer delight of colorful wings, for neighbors and communities with whom to share this life, for your son whose gifts of presence and teaching show us the way and embolden us to act. We pray that our gifts of time, talent, and treasure may be blessed by you, used for purposes that honor you and care for all in need in your creation. Amen. Our closing hymn is from Voices United number 639, One More Step Along the Way I Go. step along the world I go, one more step along the world I go, from the old things to the new, keep me traveling along with you, and it's from the old I travel to the new, keep me traveling along with you, round the corner of the world I turn, more and more about the world I learn, all the new things that I see, you'll be looking at along with me, and it's from the old I travel to the new, keep me traveling along with you. As I travel through the bad and good, keep me traveling the way I should, where I see no way to go, you'll be telling me the way I know, and it's from the old I travel to the new, keep me traveling along with you. Give me courage when the world is rough, keep me loving, oh, the world is tough, Leap and sing in all I do. Keep me traveling along with you. And it's from the old I travel to the new. Keep me traveling along with you. You are older than the world can be. You are younger than the life in me. Ever old and ever new. Keep me traveling along with you, and it's from the old I travel to the new. Keep me traveling along with you. And so we go forth. We go forth trusting in the gifts that we have been given. We go forth to gather together as community, to share in all that Jesus calls us to do in all that we may offer to others. It seems small sometimes, but in reality, our gifts are immense. Go in God's love. Go to serve. So I'm going to change this light. I, I'm not going to put it out. I'm just changing it. See how it's, it's in one place. You may not be able to see it, or there's maybe a little bit there, but now the light is everywhere. And now everywhere you are today, the light will go with you. Amen.